All right, hey everyone. Hope you're ready to continue talking about polling and public opinion, and specifically the link between attitudes and opinions. Uh, so I want to go uh, back in time a little bit and tell you a story about uh, a, a very famous poll that was conducted in the year of 1936. And so uh, you may know about new, um, magazines called Time, you know, or Life Magazine, or maybe National Geographic. Um, there was a, a, a magazine that was perhaps even more important than all of those magazines in 1936 called Literary Digest. It was a huge um, sort of subscribership magazine. A lot of people uh, subscribed to it. A lot of people knew about it. Uh, people bought it on newsstands, uh, maybe before they were going to take their train ride or whatever. Um, and ultimately, this, this uh, uh, firm was actually a huge... Um, sort of media conglomerate, Literary Digest. And um, one of the things that they tried to accomplish in 1936 was, uh, for some of the very first uh, efforts at this, was to predict the winner of an election using a pre-election poll. And so what they did, the sort of uh, uh, editors of Literary Digest did, was they found the names and addresses of 10 million or so people, and they used vehicle registration records, and they also used their own records of subscriberships uh, to send these surveys at great cost to themselves, uh, again, to this very, very large number of Americans. And if you think about this, in 1936, right, currently there's over 300 million Americans living in the, in the United States. In 1936, it was, you know, maybe half that number. So, I mean, this is, this is pretty, a huge number of people. This is maybe like 7% of the entire population of the United States. This is a giant survey effort, much larger than any kind of survey that we might conduct today. And so, of course, 1936, we have this, you know, huge election between FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt versus Alf Landon. Uh, and so the, the big question here was, which of these candidates is going to emerge victorious? Are we going to have essentially the continuation of New Deal policies, uh, which are going to essentially uh, get us uh, out of the Great, the Great Depression? Or are we going to have a return uh, to, to, you know, slightly more uh, austerity as uh, implemented by Republicans in 1936? So uh, this huge election pitted these candidates, and um, essentially as the you know, October turns to November, envelopes poured into Literary Digest. I mean, just imagine what it would be like to be a receptionist or a secretary or a mailroom worker in this Literary Digest magazine to get millions, literally millions of responses. Think of like they must have had a warehouse full of these responses. Um, and so the employees opened every envelope and they counted up um, all of these responses. They recorded over 2.3 million responses for a response rate of over 23%. And ultimately, after all this counting, they produced a report and the results predicted a landslide, which, of course, we're all familiar with the winner of the 1936 presidential election, President Alf Landon, right? Well, if you're... Uh, not firmly aware of the fact that I am uh, joking on this slide. Go back to your history lessons and take a look at what actually happened in 1936. Alf Landon, of course, this is a this is a fake image. Alf Landon did not win the presidential election in 1936. Um, in fact, I want to provide a little bit of a comparison just to show you what the 1936 election was like. Um, so this is the 2008 presidential election. This is the Electoral College map. And again, of course, the blue states here are going to Barack Obama. The red states here are going to John McCain. As we've said, there's, there's a couple of eccentricities here where Nebraska and Maine split their votes, but in this case, it was only Nebraska that split their electoral votes with just one going to Obama. Anyway, what I'm trying to show you from this image is if you add up the numbers on this, on this uh, um, map, right, we get the 27 from Florida, the 55 from California, the 21 from Illinois, the 31 from New York, the 21 from Pennsylvania, Ohio, even Indiana, right? Compare this to this year's map, the 2020 presidential election, um, and you'll see, right, that there's a big uh, number, essentially, of blues here if we count up the blues. And there's a much smaller number, you know, Texas notwithstanding, of reds here. This is essentially a pretty big landslide as far as modern elections go. However, let's compare this to the 1936 election results, again, where Alf Landon, as it turns out, lost to FDR um, by a lot, actually. In fact, this is one of the most enormous landslides in Electoral College history, actually, where Alf Landon's only won two states of uh, Vermont and Maine. The rest of the country uniformly, unanimously uh, voted for FDR. And yet, Literary Digest magazine had predicted that Alf Landon was going to win in a landslide. And so this is about as wrong as you can possibly get in forecasting an election. <laughs> I mean, there is literally almost no way to be more wrong than this. To say that he was gonna win uh, the Electoral College 
uh, with, with a ton of red states and for it to look like this at the end of the day. And so the question is, how the heck could Literary Digest have gotten this outcome so unbelievably wrong? And so the answer to that question is ultimately uh, an answer that we in polling sciences, we in political science, sociology, and statistics have been working on since the 1930s to arrive at far better polling uh, efforts that are actually quite reliable um, in terms of their actual uh, actual measurements relative to, to that time back then. And so again, we need to, to you know, include insights from a variety of disciplines to get better at polling as we have over the last, you know, almost 100 years of, of doing this. And, um, you know, I think there's a number of, of specific lessons that this teaches us that we need to contend with as, um, as scholars, right? And so the, the first question here is, uh, is about selection bias, essentially. And if you go back to think about the method by which the Literary Digest poll actually sent out their surveys to individuals, you have to remember that that's actually not a very fair way of getting at the average American. Because remember, they used vehicle registration records and magazine subscriptions in order to develop this list. And so essentially, this is a biased list because in 1936, the average Republican had a much higher income than the average Democrat. The New Deal Coalition essentially was this group of individuals who were suffering from the Great Recession and who were able to benefit from the policies of the New Deal. And so a lot of those people who liked the New Deal because they were being pulled out of extreme poverty um, by those policies were very favorable of the Democrats. And so the question is, uh, how is this selection bias? Well, if you use vehicle registration records, that means that you're getting a lot more vehicle owners than non-vehicle owners in your sample. And Republicans, of course, are more likely to own the cars here, ha having been wealthier, and also, therefore, to have gotten the survey in the first place. So already you're tinting your sample towards wealthier people, and by virtue of that wealth gap, you're also tinting that survey sample a little bit redder than it might otherwise be. So right, who could afford this car in 1936, right? Somebody who, you know, in 1935 was in a bread line? Probably not. But that, that's not the only issue here, right? We also have a thing called patterned non-response. And of course, we had uh, 2.3 million uh, mailers sent back vis-a-vis -vis 10 million that were sent out. And so, um, you know, really, if we think about this, how long might it take to fill out this survey and mail it back to the magazine? I mean, maybe a minute or two, you know, paid postage and everything. You fill out your survey, you, you put it back in the mail. Um, but again, about 75% or more of uh, the people who, um, who got this survey didn't fill it out. And so you have to think about why is it that those specific, you know, 23% or so of people that mailed it back, why did they do that in the first place? Could it have been that they were especially motivated to have their voices heard because they knew, you know, in their heart of hearts the, that, um, that Alphalanda didn't have much of a chance, right? Or maybe it was that these, again, uh, lower income Democrats who were suffering from the uh, Great Recession just you know a few years earlier, maybe it was the case that uh, they didn't have time or they didn't have resources to uh, mail back the survey. They had bigger fish to fry, right? They had more on their mind, you know, more to deal with than some of these maybe wealthier Republicans who had some spare time to fill out a survey and send it back. So pattern non-response also could have biased the sample. And so again, you know, as I just mentioned, some people might have uh, wanted to cheer for um, for Landon, right? Because they they essentially knew that Landon was going to lose when it came to election day. So why not at least let our voice be heard in the survey? So uh, there's also the potential that there's greater motivation to respond among certain individuals. And so all of that, right? Selection bias, pattern on response together can result in a reddening. You know, I'm using red for Republicans and blue for Democrats. A reddening of the sample relative to the average American. And so, again, if we have the entire U.S. voting eligible population represented by this circle, if we're using vehicle registration data in order to select who gets mailed this, this survey, right, then we're excluding this slightly bluer group that doesn't have vehicle registration data, right? They ride the trolley to work or something, or, you know, they don't have a car uh, at all for whatever reason. These car owners, they're going to be a little more Republican here. And then begin, uh, beyond that, within that set, those who got the survey and then returned it, that's also further reddening our sample. So from the voting eligible population, we result in an extraordinarily biased sample. And you can count those results as accurately as possible with zero you know, account, you know, counting errors and still arrive at an incredibly wrong answer. 
And so now, you know, in present day, we obviously are much better at this than the Literary Digest magazine was in 1936. Uh, no, you know, no, no short part due to um, George Gallup and some of the other early pioneers in polling science. And so um, polling scientists, you know, now seek to gather representative samples of respondents, which means that we are able to use census data uh, that, that gets at basic demographics of different areas. We can use sophisticated sampling methods, essentially, to be able to ensure that our samples actually look like a snapshot of the American population. And from there, we're able to make better, closer inferences about uh, national public opinion uh, uh, perceptions relative to these samples that used really bad sampling frames, as we would call it. And so again, we, because we're mirroring the US census in these, uh, in these polling snapshots, we're able to get a lot closer to the truth than we would otherwise. But of course, that's not the only uh, thing that's wrong with some of these uh, surveys. We also have to think about the design of surveys themselves. And so in other uh, module content later here in the, in the module, we'll be thinking a lot about survey design and how we might be able to use some uh, components of psychology, especially, uh, to be able to arrive at better predictions than we might otherwise. So let's get into some of those big problems now uh, to talk about just exactly what it is that we need to consider when trying to design really good survey instruments. And so when political scientists first started doing these surveys, you know, I think that we were surprised to discover certain uh, features of public opinion. You know, even though we might have gotten uh, representative samples and we've we developed better sampling frames to be able to um, get closer to the truth, um, you know, one issue that started to emerge in early you know, scientific surveys, we might call them, in the 1960s, was that we started to observe that when we asked individuals the same questions over time, people seemed to change their minds a lot. So much so that some survey scientists declared, well, it seems like people are just choosing answers at random when they're filling out surveys. Seems like a whole lot of people out there are simply guessing when we ask them important questions, like do you want more government or less government? You know, do you favor you know, a, a policy or, you, or do you uh, not favor a policy? People seem to just be changing their responses at random if, if we ask them one month and then we ask them again the next month. And so, you know, if you think about it, if you really, you know, focus on this question of what this might mean, um, you know, there's kind of two possible conclusions that we might draw. And one could be that people are just guessing at random because they simply don't understand the policies that they're being asked about. They're, they're being asked about this bewildering world of politics. You know, they've only been watching, you know, football and supermarket sweep every week. And if we ask them about some complicated policy, they just aren't going to know enough about it to be able to say anything meaningful. And so they want to be nice to the survey, um, the, the person who's, who's conducting the survey. And so they say, I'll give you an answer. But it turns out that that answer is meaningless. Or the other possibility, in addition to the fact that some people might not understand the questions, could be that people are simply affected by minor impulses, by minor sort of little, um, little pushes, little nudges on their consciousness. And that might actually be enough to cause variation in the way that they respond from week to week. And so we might imagine, right, for example, two people um, who just happen to share the names of my cat and my dog, um, Ellie and Gus. And so let's imagine that Ellie was at Starbucks and, you know, went through the socially distanced line and was able to obtain a glorious pumpkin spice latte, which is her very favorite thing. Um, and as it turned out, even better, the person ahead of her paid for it in line. It's like a pay it forward situation. And so Ellie got a pumpkin spice latte for free. So you might imagine she's having a great day so far, right? However, Gus bought a pumpkin spice latte because he's a dog, he's very clumsy, he managed to spill it everywhere, um, and so he's very grumpy. He's now out of pumpkin spice latte. He wasn't able to enjoy that delicious fall flavor. He's really struggling today. And so soon after the worst possible scenario occurred, right? A social scientist came up and said, hey, Ellie, Gus, on a scale of one to five, with one being very unhappy and five being very happy, how happy would you say you are about your life in general? And so you can imagine Gus is covered in pumpkin spice latte. He's really having a horrible day. And he says, look, I'm a two out of five. I'm not doing so good. And Ellie says, somebody just paid for my pumpkin spice latte. There is hope in the world after all, right? I'm a four out of five. However, of course, Gus being a dog and Ellie being a cat, 
On most ordinary days, Gus is a pretty happy-go-lucky guy, and Ellie's a grumpy cat, as Ellie's a two. And so their responses are reversed, but simply because something had just happened to them that made them think differently about the world around them. And so if, they, if that sur same survey scientist had come back and asked them um, to answer that same question on any other day of the week, they would actually give a different answer. And so essentially, when people were asked about the question, they immediately recalled the things that had most recently happened in their life, and they ignored some of the other, you know, potentially important things that caused them to be, you know, happy or not happy, right? Oh, I have to take online classes because, you know, the COVID crisis has, has uh, made it difficult for me to be on campus, and I have to go through all these module videos, right? I'm, I'm a one out of five, right? Um, but if I got a pumpkin spice latte, all of a sudden I'm a four. And so... What this means, right, the fact that these very recent kinds of nudges might change people's perceptions of the world around them, this is what we might call a top-of-the-head response. And so this is not actually the true attitude that Gus and Ellie might have in their heads, right? Again, we said that attitudes are latent. They're something that people have um, sort of built up over long, the long term, and they're, they're um, not unstable. They're actually quite stable. And so again, that process of expressing one's opinion on that one specific survey ended up resulting in essentially a deflection or a movement away from a true attitude. So this is again, going back to the very beginning of this module video, one of the reasons why people's attitudes are not equal in all cases to their opinions. Their opinions are uh, essentially a noisy snapshot of true attitudes. So this noise comes in, this, this fuzz, this deflection, or this a potential error, essentially, in obtaining a true measurement of someone's attitude. Uh, that part of that is the top of the head response. The fact that uh, very recently recalled things can move people's attitudes, or move people's opinions, excuse me, when they're expressing their attitudes on paper. And so, in fact, right, this effect can go further because even though you know this uh, this first survey question was simply about people's general. What we, call, what we might call their valence, or sort of what people you know, think about how they're doing in, in general. We might have even asked Ellie another question about a specific, um, a specific policy, right? So maybe free trade, and Ellie made the connection in her mind. She was able to associate this delicious low-cost coffee with cheap imports, and she said, yeah, free trade is a good thing. I like that because I'm able to get cheap Starbucks. Um, you know, and if there were tariffs on coffee beans, all of a sudden my coffee would be a lot more expensive. And so maybe there is some sort of association in her mind between those two um, idea elements, which means that she might further have response instability in even very specific questions about things like coffee. And so what I'm trying to get at with this kind of silly example is that response instability can also have an effect and be affected by the way that we link together thoughts and ideas in our heads. And so in all of our minds, we have essentially a network that exists uh, called a cognitive schema. And so this cognitive schema, I like to think about it as if political scientists or polling scientists are fishers, you know, uh, fishermen and fisherwomen. They um, cast a question, essentially, as if it were some sort of bait into the minds of this sort of swimming pool of, my, of a person's mind, and they reel in some kind of answer right, when they ask a question. But that answer, almost like the way that you know you might reel in like a piece of seaweed that's connected to an old boot that's connected to another person's fishing line that's connected to another fish or something, it's all sort of junked together with a whole bunch of things that are trailing off of that initial response. These schematic links essentially mean that when we ask a question, we often dredge up things we didn't expect. Um, and essentially, we can unintentionally tap into schemas, or again, those, those cognitive associations, which might even produce further instability, even as we ask questions from um, one question to the next. And so this response instability, again, is also about the way that we associate idea elements in our minds. So uh, cognitive schema, I think that it's a really important concept for understanding public opinion and understanding how uh, the average American thinks about politics. The way that we develop those schema and the way that we create those associations between, you know, feelings and, um, you know, facts and, um, you know, even uh, uh, assumptions about candidates or uh, policy preferences, all of those associations are going to together have an impact on the way that we express our opinions uh, whenever we're asked. 
And so, right, for example, we could think about this, right? Do you agree that citizens should be free to exercise their right to free speech by cursing in public? Right? So here we've asked a question that says, essentially, citizens should be free to exercise their right to free speech. Now let's compare this question, which is ultimately about cursing in public, that's the thing we, we care about here, with this other way of asking the question. Do you agree that children should be kept safe from the harmful influence of cursing in public? Right? So here we've got two different idea elements that are attached to the thing we're trying to get at, which is cursing in public. And should you be able to drop a bunch of F-bombs in public? Well, of course, it's part of our right to free speech. I would say that that's always the case. We should definitely allow cursing in public. Or do you agree that children should be kept safe? Right? All of a sudden, we've got this countervailing um, schematic idea. Oh, we got to keep children's ears safe from those horrible curse words, right? the harmful influence. And so we've attached in this question right, two rival considerations that would cause actually people to say different things on the survey. And so this again gets into this question of survey design. When we're trying to create a scientific survey, which is attempting to get, a, get us closer and closer to the truth of what the average American thinks about the world of politics, we need to be very aware of the fact that we might be in, uh, you know, accidentally building in cognitive schematic associations that link these ideas in the minds of people and deflect people's attitudes, or people's opinions, excuse me, away from their true attitudes. And so, of course, I'm sure that you probably are um, painfully aware of the fact that there exist certain surveys in which this kind of thing, right, this kind of schematic association is actually the goal. And so the last thing I'm going to mention uh, today is the fact that there's actually people out there, especially during a campaign season, who are attempting explicitly to do this um, in a way to invoke certain schemas in the minds of individuals. This is what we call a push poll. And it's essentially a very dirty word in the world of polling. It's a way that uh, campaigns might sort of nefariously try to influence people's cognitive schemas. They're actually hacking this schematic idea from the ground up instead of uh, trying to tap a true opinion. So they might ask, you know, questions like, oh, do you, you know, what do you think about the fact that candidate X is a horrible, you know, lecherous person who was, you know, caught in 17 scandals? Whether or not that's true, I don't know. But if you were able to ask a question that puts those two things together, um, th the uh, person who's answering the question might not actually know much about what's happening and might therefore start to associate in their minds those two schematic elements in the future. And so push polls have the opposite uh, purpose of a scientific poll that's attempting to measure what people actually think. This is actually trying to sway people by asking questions that are so loaded that they actually end up pushing people in one direction or the next in their subsequent judgments and potentially their voting decisions. And so be on the lookout for push polls. Right? Ask uh, people who their polling firm is and try to do research on who it is that's actually polling you if you uh, are lucky enough to be one of the individuals that's included in a polling sample. So again, I'm going to leave it here for now. We can talk much more about public opinion in later uh, content modules, but uh, I really hope that you uh, have gained an appreciation in this discussion for the fact that polling science has come a very long way uh, over the last hundred years or so, and we've come to learn a tremendous amount about how we might use the insights from statistics, from psychology, from sociology, and from political science uh, to get much, much better at polling than uh, our first, you know, terrible attempts in 1936 with polls like the Literary Digest poll. So uh, until next time, I wish you all a wonderful week and good luck studying uh, this content.